Hello and welcome back to Polytoots. In this tutorial we're taking a wee little break from shaders and dipping our toes into some texture creation instead. The main reason for this is because a few people have asked about the various normal maps, height maps or other textures that we've been using in our tutorials so that's what this will be. I'll show you a few quick methods that I use in Blender and I'll try to take the approach of assuming that you've never used Blender before so this may be a little slow to get going but once the basics are out of the way we can speed up a bit. I do have my hotkeys enabled on the screen, but it's worth mentioning that I have changed my general navigation keys, so things like orbiting, rotating, and even zooming I have changed to something a bit more cozy. Everything else is the default though, so we should be all good. We'll start by pressing A to select everything, then press X to delete and confirm. Then we'll make another box for some reason by pressing Shift and A, Mesh, and Cube. Then hit tab to go into an editing mode, now the number 3 to go into face select and I'm going to select the top face here and just scale it down with the S key. Move it up a bit with the G key just to grab it and Z to lock to the Z axis when you're doing that. Do a little inset with I and then press E to extrude it and by default it will extrude along the face normal so I'll put it down there and call it a day. Let's also chuck in a sphere here, so again shift A, mesh and UV sphere. We'll give this one a quick sculpt, but for now I'm just going to move it over here and right click Shade Smooth to get rid of those uh, face headed visuals. If you'd rather just move things with a regular gizmo then you can click on the move tool over here and that'll do you just right. Blender is a little odd with how it does things like this by default compared to other programs, but I've been using 3ds Max since about 2002 and honestly I tend not to deviate too much from the default setup in Blender, you get used to it pretty quickly. I'm going to hop on over to the sculpt room to get working on this sphere and there are many ways to start sculpting things in Blender but I'm just going to do the remesh method to give us more geometry to work with. We'll want to enable the smooth normals checkbox up here in the remesh menu and this is also where you can change the resolution and apply those changes but I'll use hotkeys for that. So hit shift and R and now we have this nice visual aid to let us know what resolution we're choosing. Careful not to make those squares too small but also Blender can handle a pretty beefy amount of polys even on lower end machines so you know be careful but not like super careful. When you're happy just left click to close the guide and hit Control and R to apply that remesh. Now we have a little more geometry here I'm going to mostly use the grab tool to pull the mesh around the inflate tool to make some big old spotties and the, uh, the creases and pinch tools to sharpen things up a bit. All of these are accessible on the menu to the left or with hotkeys of course which you can see by hovering over the brushes. You can also use the F key to change brush size or shift and F to change the brush strength. This is pretty much how I made the fire and smoke texture from the Zelda explosion tutorial that we did in Unity. If you find that your geometry is still a little low poly, just do the shift and R to change the resolution again and uh, make those squares a bit smaller. And then click the close and control R to apply. If the change in resolution is too high, you can end up with this uh, face headed mesh, but holding down the shift key on most sculpt brushes will turn it into a smoothing brush. And once you get past a certain density, this face setting issue doesn't exist, so don't worry about it too much. And so now for the first handy feature, we can generate normal maps from what we're looking at. And you can do this in all of the 3D rooms I think, but to keep my sculpt room as it is, I'm going to go back to the layout tab and then come up here to the top right where we can get a drop down for the viewport shading. From here we can select mat cap and then click on the material icon to get a menu of default mat caps and here's where you'll find this little beauty, the normal map mat cap. And this is how I tend to crank out some quick normals, plus it's in 3D so technically your resolution can be as large as you want and everybody knows that programmers love it when you dump hundreds of 8K normal map textures into a project so you know, go nuts. By default the resolution should be whatever your screen size is, so for me this is going to do a 1920 by 1080 screenshot. We'll want to disable the overlays so we're not seeing any of the grid or pivot info or you know any UI stuff like that. And we can also enable transparency by coming over to the render properties expanding the film category and clicking the checkbox. This way when we do a render of the viewport by going to view, viewport, render image, we'll get the alpha included, which is optional of course, it just makes life easier for little things like this. So that's normal maps, just model whatever you want to turn into a normal map and then just do it. Very cool. Let's also cover height maps before we move on to some tiling examples. We may as well re-enable overlays just so we can see what we're doing. And let's also change our viewport mode to material instead of solid. And we can do this by just pressing the Z key and then we get some options. 
This means we've lost the mat cap, but we'll now be able to see any materials on our objects. So, you know, let's go make one. I'm going to split my view by coming down to the bottom left. And when it turns into this plus icon, I'm going to click and drag out a new window and then change this window to the shader editor. And now with an object selected, I can see there is no material applied. So I'll click the new button to make a new one. And since we had the object selected, it will automatically assign this new material to it. We don't need the default setup, so let's get rid of this. And instead we can bring in a texture coordinate node with Shift and A, and then just search for it. That's usually the easiest way to get these things. And then we'll also get a separate XYZ node. And then we want to hook the generated option into the vector. Then just grab the Z vector, which in Blender is the vertical axis, and stick it into the surface slot in the output. This creates a black and white gradient that is local to the object it's on, with you know white being at the top and black being at the bottom. You may notice it's not correct though, and we'll get to that. Height maps are a bit of a different beast than normal maps. Like We can't just take a screenshot of this, we need to make sure that we're outputting at least a 16-bit, but ideally a 32-bit image. This is because we need to avoid any banding in the grayscales that can cause, you know, like uh, pixelated or blocky results. Height map should really be, you know, like as smooth as butter, you know. So before we can render this out, we'll need to come over here to the render properties and under color management, where it has sRGB listed, we'll change this to none. And you may have noticed uh, in the viewport there that the gradients just changed as well. Now they're correct and ready to be rendered. To my knowledge, it doesn't matter how we render this, so long as we save it in a format with good sampling resolution. So we can render the view again, and then come here to save our file, and choose OpenEXR to be on the safe side. It's going to be a 32-bit image, and that'll do you nicely. There are of course settings for resolution and aspect ratio, so you don't always get a render that's the size of your screen. And we can also set up a camera rather than relying on the view. Uh, and we'll cover this stuff in a bit as we move on to the next example, which will be tiling textures. But first, a quick message from this video's sponsor, wingfox.com, who have given me a juicy little code to give you. It's 15% off all their courses. They're an online digital art learning platform, previously known as Yehu, and they're rebranding and just piling on the content. So when they asked me if I wanted to promote one of their courses, I said no. I said I'd like to promote all of them instead. So if you follow the link in the description and use the code WFR15, you'll get 15% off any course that you desire. And it also helps out my channel as well. So yeah, use my link, use the code, everybody's happy. Peace out. Okay, so back to work. Let's do the first tiling example, which will be the simplest sort of tiling you can get, which is just sculpting across one single mesh. Uh, so I'm just gonna revert the scene a bit. I'm gonna re-enable the overlays, remove these dudes collapse this window down, and most importantly, set the color mode back to sRGB, otherwise things are going to look super dark. Or we could just start a blank new scene, but sometimes the longer road is the most fulfilling. At least that's what I tell myself when I can't do a tutorial that's quicker than 15 minutes. So we'll put another cube in via the Shift A menu, and let's get back into solid mode as well. So I'll hit Z and choose solid. We still have the normal map mat cap enabled, so just pop back over to the top right and choose the default mat cap, which is the leftmostest, most leftist? Mm. Anyway. There are a few ways to change the size of our cube, but for now uh, I'm just going to hit the N key to bring out this menu over on the right. Make sure I'm in the item tab and then come down to the dimensions. I'm going to click and drag over both the X and the Y and then enter a value of 1200. But I'm going to leave the Z as it was. And for reference, uh, 1000 centimeters or 10 meters is what I want my actual tile to be in this example, but we're giving it some breathing room. What we've done by changing the X and Y only uh, is actually change the scale of our object to be non-uniform. So you see here where it's 6 on the X and Y and 1 on the Z. You always want your object scale set to 1 across the board. So I'm going to press Ctrl and A and apply the scale, which will set it back to 1. Tidy. Before we jump into the sculpting room, I'm going to sort out the camera and output resolution. These two things are sort of related. So first off, let's just hit Shift and A and add a camera in. It's gone to the location of the 3D cursor, so hit Alt and Z to turn things slightly invisible, and now we can see it. I'm now going to hit Alt and R to clear the rotation, and if for you all this does is pop up some statistics from NVIDIA, then have a moment of reflection and promise yourself to look into that later. Hit Alt and R again to close whatever the hell that was, and just come over to the rotation information here, click and drag, and set to zero. That's what the Alt R would have done anyway, so, you know, no biggie. Now press G to grab, and Z to move the camera up on the Z-axis. Now if you press this camera button here, or press numpad 0, 
if you're all fancy and have a numpad, then you can see through the eye of the camera. And let's change the aspect ratio by altering our resolution over here in the output properties. I'm gonna go with 512 because it's the greatest texture resolution of all time, but you know, feel free to do whatever you want. Next up, let's come over to the object data properties. And this icon will change depending on what you have selected, which is, which is pretty neat. And we'll change the type to orthographic and set the scale to 10. The scale being 10 is pretty important. This is equal to 10 meters or, you know, a thousand centimeters. And if you remember, I said I wanted our actual tiling area to be 10 meters, but I gave some breathing room of 1200 centimeters, which is 12 meters or 39.37 feet if you want to watch the world burn. The reason I didn't make this box exactly 10 meters is because for tiling sculpts like this, you want to give yourself some overlap where the continuous detail or strokes cross over, otherwise you can end up with seams around the edges, which, you know, it defeats the entire point of a tiling texture. If you click the camera view button again, or just orbit the view, then it will drop out of the camera. And let's come over to the sculpt room, and if you prefer, just hide the camera from the view. You don't need to have it visible to see through it, which is, you know, pretty cool. As an aside, if you're selecting the camera and changing rooms, then there's a good chance that you might end up in the sculpture room with, you know, no sculpting tools. So, you know, if this happens to you, just make sure you've got your object selected and then hit control and tab and switch it back to sculpt mode. Just like before, I'm going to remesh this for more geometry. So shift R, choose, click, control R and done. And now we just need to enable tiling. So come down to the symmetry category in the active tool settings and enable tiling on the X and Y. By default, it will tile every one meter, which is handy for some you know very specific things. But for us, let's do a similar method to the camera scale and set the X and Y offset to 10. I'll just do a couple of quick doodles here, just with you know some regular sculpt brushes. And then just go to the camera view with numpad zero and you can see the camera bounds are falling exactly on where the tiling repeats and because we added some breathing room on the outside of our cube we can rest easy knowing that uh, we'll get a fully seamless tile once you're done with the sculpt or if you just want to test it make sure to disable the overlays stick on the normals mat cap and then render the viewport again if it comes out blank it's because you need to drop out of sculpt mode for it to update so i'm just going to control tab change modes and then control tab again and switch back to sculpt mode now it will update and render correctly. Let's also take another look at creating the height maps or displacement maps. They're the same thing, so don't worry about terminology. I'm gonna just recreate the setup we had before since it doesn't exist here. Now, because this material will create a gradient based on the object bounds, meaning you know it starts black on the bottom of the mesh and then ends white at the top, there may be scenarios where we don't want the bottom of the mesh to be the starting point, like our portion of the mesh here only exists because we needed something to sculpt on. We don't actually need to factor into a height map. So one solution for this is a color ramp node. So I'm gonna hit Shift and A and search for it and just stick it between the separate X, Y, Z and the output. And now we can increase the level at which the black starts. Similarly, of course, you can also redefine where the highest point is, but um, you'll probably never need to. So that's example number two, but what if you wanted to do things in many pieces like stonework or bricks or other examples that are all basically the same, where some things are repeated across the texture seamlessly, but others are not. Something like this, for example, where we have areas which have the texture go all the way across and repeat on either side, and others where the objects are purposefully cut but still have seamless points going out of the bounds. And then these other pieces which don't need to go out of the camera bounds because they're fully separated on the edges anyway. Well, the answer is still tiling, but also not, and also instancing. If I just get the simpler version of this, for example's sake, and delete this dude, and then grab this, and use Alt D to create an instance of it, and go into edit mode to change it, the changes happen to the instances as well. So, you know, very easy to understand, very cool. And as for the correct positioning, that is also super duper simple. Like, all you have to do is move it on whatever axis you want by the same distance as your camera scale. So if you remember in the previous example, we'd set the camera to a scale of 10, which is, you know, 10 meters. And in this file, I have it as 15 because apparently it would kill me to be consistent for just once in my life. It doesn't matter where the pivot of your object is either. This one, for example, is in the center of the object, but it can be literally anywhere. I can do Alt D to instance, right click to drop out of the movement tool. So it puts the instance back to the original location. Then with it still selected, 
come over to the location menu, select your desired axis. And since we're working in centimeters, just add a minus 1500 to the end of the existing value. So, you know, we're taking the value that is already there and minusing 1500 from it. Then just hit enter and bada bing, bada boom. So if I come into the sculpting room to take a look at the more final product here, you can see that if I start sculpting on a piece like this, it's just adding the same detail to the other instances. So, you know, let's just go ahead and we'll hide all the instances because we already understand that and we'll see what's left. All of these pieces down at the bottom don't overlap outside the camera bounds. That's because they have like this intentional separation of the bounds. You know, like I've made sure that that's where that, you know, that piece ends. So there's no tiling, there's no symmetry, there's no instancing. It's just, you know, unique separate pieces. There's no need to repeat the detail because none of these pieces you know, continue outside of the bounds. So, you know, nothing special there. We can hide these as well. This last piece here is actually the only one that I've used tiling on, just one axis. And because the camera bounds are 15, so too is my offset down here in the symmetry category. But it's worth noting this is not symmetry, it is actually just the tiling offset. So left and right is seamless and unique detail can go in the middle. I realize that this example is not exactly catered towards textures that you would use commonly for shaders, but um, this is gonna help teach just one last thing about the height map material. So I'll make one just again and assign it to all of these pieces. Now, if you see here, I have some suspiciously raised pieces. And since this gradient is calculated for the object bounds, black being the bottom and white being the top, we're not going to get a correct render here because from a top-down view, the white values for these raised pieces and the pieces lower than it are the same. So there's plenty of ways to fix this, but my preferred method is to rely on the object's pivot points. So for starters, I'm gonna to come to the texture corner node here and change the output from generated to object. And what this is gonna do is base the black point or you know the start of our gradient at wherever our pivot point is. That's why some of these pieces just went pure black because their pivots are higher than the mesh for some convenient reason. So since my 3D cursor is still at the default root position here and all of my meshes are above it, I'm gonna just select everything and then come up here to object, set origin and choose origin to 3D cursor. Now, the pivots of all of these meshes are at the same place. And I mean, it's really only the Z position that matters, but you know, it's all good. The gradient is now uniform across them, as you can see here, where it's now impossible to tell where one object ends and another begins. Okay, so that's it for the examples done. And for this portion, we're now gonna move into uh, Photoshop, where I'm gonna drop one of the first examples in, and I'll show how I set it up for ch channel packing for use in Unity shaders. Uh, obviously, this is a bit of a weird segue for those of you who are just here for the Blender stuff. So, you know, we can say bye-bye for now, and let me know if you'd like to see more Blender stuff. And for everybody else, uh, let's just get this goose cooked, eh? We're nearly at the end now, come on. So here we are in Photoshop and contrary to everything we've just covered, I didn't export a normal or height map for this texture. I just rendered a screenshot as is and got something like this. So I'm gonna start by duplicating this twice. And for the sake of the tutorial, I'll name my layers like a good boy. Now some quick tweaks to the smoke. Uh, I do want it to be darker overall and to hide these highlights on the bubbly bits. So I'm gonna use levels first to get those shadows all ramped up and then uh, the lighter sides are you know, almost white. Then I'll use a lightness slider to darken everything, which can't darken our shadows because they were already black. So, you know, that's good. For the glow, very similar, but I'll start by inverting the image and then I will boost the values. And then lastly, for what will be my alpha, it's really only the outline that I want here. So I'm gonna make a new layer, make sure my color palette over here is black and white. And I'll throw in some noise, which for Photoshop is just some clouds. Then I'm going to add a polar coordinates filter to make it circular. And this, by the way, was just because I wanted my texture to alpha out in this style. You could just do regular noise or, you know, whatever you wanted to. Um, so now I'm going to get the selection of the original texture and invert it and then remove it from the noise. And then uh, throw in some soft white spots here just to help out with the style of the smoke disappearing. When I have all three done and I'm happy, I'll make a new document with the size set to the greatest texture resolution of all time, 512 by 512. And I'll also reduce the size of that first document to 512 as well. 
With Photoshop, it's worth remembering that you can't draw or paste images to the RGB channels if the document is blank. So to begin with, I'll just fill it with black, then come over to the original, copy the smoke texture, then over to the new one and go into the channels tab, go to the red channel and paste. Then back over to the original, layers tab, copy our glow, back to the new, channels tab, green channel, paste, and you know, repeat for the alpha too. If you're confused as to why I'm putting the alpha in the blue channel rather than making a new alpha channel in this texture, it's because this is going into a shader in Unity and I can do whatever I want. So that's that, and uh, yeah, I mean channel packing is a really great way to store lots of info that you can access later. The only thing to keep in mind is that even though the end result here is this beautifully colored monster, you are limited to only working with grayscale textures. I mean, you can obviously overlay color later, but for now it's just, you know, it's just gray. There's still plenty of other roads worth traveling down. We haven't even touched on one of Blender's most powerful texture creation tools, the shader editor itself, which can be thought of like a lightweight version of Substance Designer, especially with add-ons. But uh, this tutorial was mostly just for some, you know, handcrafted, sculpted stuff that we can turn into textures. And, uh, you know, I hope it was of some use. As usual, I want to thank all of my lovely patrons. You really keep that motivation candle burning and, you know, prevent the channel from just fizzling out and dying. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, for everyone else, I will see you in the next one. I mean, I guess technically I would also see the patrons in the next one. It's really awkward to say goodbye with these things. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna cut.